My name is Ed Carpenter, as you probably already heard, and I drive 220 miles an hour for a living. Much before I was driving at any speed, I was just another kid growing up in the American Midwest. I tease this picture, but I was born in a small town in Illinois and had my first taste of speed when my dad bought me that three-wheeler when I was three years old. If my memory serves me correct, my mom's here. I think I crashed it into the bush in the background of that photo, so the taste was short-lived. I wasn't born into a racing family, but I was raised into a racing family. I moved to Indianapolis when I was eight years old when my mom married my stepdad, now just my dad, Tony George. Tony spent most of his life leading the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and introduced my brother and I to racing that same year I moved to Indianapolis. Growing up, racing wasn't always exactly a cool thing to do in school. I was doing something different than a lot of the other kids, something that they didn't quite understand, and I was so consumed by it, and that's something that at times I actually got made fun of, which seems kind of funny now. I remember one time I was sitting at a lunch table, and there were kids actually making race car noises, IndyCar sounds going around the table, like, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> yeah, right? So things like that definitely bothered me at the time, I would say. Uh, but at the same time, it never took away my love for what I wanted to do. And by the time I finished high school, I knew that this was my future. My driving career started when I was eight years old in quarter midgets. It then progressed on to USAC midgets, sprint cars, silver crown, then to Indy Lights, which is the development series for IndyCar, and ultimately to IndyCar, where I am today. So the picture you see on the screen, that's one of my early quarter midgets, my sister Lauren standing in the cockpit with the rest of my family around me. Next, we have my mom and I celebrating my first national midget series win in Louisville, Kentucky. My dad, who I mentioned early, earlier, we actually competed against one another in the early 2000s at a midget race in Oklahoma. And I threw this one up there just because it's fun. This is my brother and I on the cover of Sports Illustrated after our first year racing. What kid didn't want to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated for kids, right? <laughs> As I was growing up, I was obviously loving racing, training to drive. It's what I wanted to do. But I was also learning about the business side of the sport by watching my dad. I was watching him make tough decisions, connect with his critics, and deal with all sorts of adversity. How many of you have ever had to hear negative things, maybe even untrue, said about a family member? I'd ask for a raise of hands. All right. Now imagine not only having to hear that, but also read it in the front page of the local newspapers. I remember being in the, in the, in the Memorial Day parade before the Indy 500, shortly after it was announced that NASCAR was coming to Indianapolis to race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now, some of you may remember it was a big deal, and a lot of people were upset about it because they viewed it against the tradition of the brickyard to have anything other than Indy cars racing at that track. And we were riding in the parade, and I, I still remember this today, people holding signs, even heckling us as we went by because they were upset about NASCAR coming to race at the Speedway. And as a kid, those emotions like that were hard to understand, and I became, I, I was probably more angry as a kid than I am now. But that was the beginning of me learning about the difficulties of our sport and of life. By the time I got to, to high school and it was time to think about college, I honestly didn't even want to go to college. I was seeing a lot of guys I was racing against focus all, focusing all of their time on their driving career, and some not even finishing high school. But I did end up going to college at Butler University right here in Indianapolis. Go dogs! Any dogs in the house? <laughs> Love to see that. Uh, I ended up there partly by choice, but mostly at the insistence of my parents. They were much smarter than me at the time, maybe still today. They had a much better understanding than I did of just how hard it was going to be for me to become a professional race driver, let alone make it to the Indy 500. And we needed to have options in case my racing career didn't actually take off. 
early in my time at Butler, I was in the business school. We had an, a class introducing us to all the majors in the business school, and we had a professor give us a, an assignment called your five-year success plan. There really weren't many guidelines to this paper. It was simple. Where do you see yourself in five years, and how are you going to get there? Boom, easy, I got this. So naturally, I wrote about racing. I know what I want to do. I know what my goals are. I ended up getting a D on that paper. <laughs> and the professor put a note on there, and he said, it's nice to have dreams, but you need to be more realistic. <laughs> yeah. I think my plan was good. I made it in four years, not five. My writing probably was not very good, which is probably where the D came from. <laughs> but anyway, while I was at Butler, I was really living two lives. I was, I was a full-time student on one hand, and I was already a full-time racing driver on the other, competing probably 50 races a year. It taught me two valuable lessons beyond, beyond my fine education from Butler. I learned how to manage my time, and I learned how to compartmentalize my focus. Those two things helped me immensely today in my dual role as a driver and a team owner. Early on in my career, I always just wanted to make it to the Indianapolis 500. I grew up here, loved the race. The Indy 500, most of you probably know, but there's people watching that don't. The Indy 500 is the largest single-day sporting event in the world, with nearly 300,000 fans coming here to watch the race each May. Millions more watching on TV. Today, it's my dream to win the Indianapolis 500, even just once. And I feel like I'm making a little progress towards that. I've been in the past 16 Indianapolis 500s. I've had three pole position starts, and I've finished second place as my best finish. So I'm getting there. Since 1911, which is when the first Indy 500 was held, there's been 777 drivers competing the race. Of those, only 65 drivers have ever won a pole position for the race, with only 18 of those having won more than one pole. And there's only 10 of us since 1911 that have won three or more poles. And of those same 777 drivers, less than one in 10 have ever gone on to win this race. A question that I get asked all the time as a race car driver is what does it feel like to drive an Indy car that fast? It's a hard question to answer. I'm not, not very good with words all the time. The picture on the screen, if you notice on the right-hand side, that's me entering turn three at Indy during qualifying last year. And you can see the speedometer. It's 237 miles an hour. It's hard to describe what that feels like. It really is for me. And I get asked all the time, so I need to find a good answer. But it's exhilarating. It's certainly a rush. And the answer that I always give, which is odd, it feels normal. It feels so normal to me. It's what I've trained my whole life to do. My instincts, my body, my mind are most comfortable in the seat of an Indy car. And you know, that's something that doesn't just happen. You don't just show up ready to race at those speeds. You know, I've been working at it for a long time. It's like other sports or disciplines. You train, you develop your skills, you have success, maybe move on to a higher level, and eventually you get there. It took me 14 years from the time I first started in quarter midgets until the first day that I drove an Indy car. Now I'd like to show you a video of the start of a race from a, a last year at Pocono. So I want to show you the start of the race and some of the things we're dealing with. <laughs> first thing you notice is I did not start on the pole of that race. I was starting at the back. Uh, there's a lot going on in the video, accelerating through the gears and really analyzing traffic, trying to figure out how I'm going to find my way to the front of this race, all the, all the while my competitors are doing the same thing. As we approach turn one, just as in life, we don't know what's around the bend. So in this next clip, I want to show you what happens around the bend in this particular race. So, as drivers, over a career, like I said, I'd been training a long time, we're trained to look as far as ahead with our eyes down the track as we can see, and it's just for cases like this. I'm guessing when you were all were watching that, you didn't realize there was an accident happening, probably until you heard my car slowing down. For me, sitting in the car, you know, you're trying to find your way to the front, about halfway down the straightaway, I saw a little puff of smoke, and that shouldn't be happening on the straightaway first lap. So I knew something was wrong. That, tells, that puts me into survival mode. I got to get myself 
in my car through the incident. In this case, even though we're still traveling over 100 miles an hour, my judgment, my instincts were good, I made it through. It's not always the case, it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, accidents or something that's gonna happen, things like that, it's part of the sport. But, it, may, you know, it makes it that much better when you do get through. Um, you know, the reality is in racing, we, we lose far more often than we win, no matter who you are. You know, like I said, it makes winning that much more special. But accidents are gonna happen, Fail, failure's gonna happen. In our everyday lives, we're not dealing with matters of life and death all the time, it's just the way it is. In racing, we are dealing with life and death. And those accidents, those failures, that's what makes us stronger, it's what makes us better as, as drivers and athletes. Mario Andretti said a long time ago, if you never crash, you just aren't trying hard enough. <laughs> so very true. In 2012, I started Ed Carpenter Racing with my dad and another partner. Owning a team had, had been something I had actually thought about for a while, but never did I actually think I would be owning a team and still driving at the same time. Uh, driving and managing the business, it definitely has its challenges. Uh, I really do love working with people and that makes it worthwhile for sure. Success to me as a team is never about us doing one big thing right to, to make a car fast at the Speedway. It's about us all working and doing our job at an extremely high level and having a hundred or more little details working as perfectly as they possibly can. One of the biggest challenges for me is managing our people and dealing with losing them to at times another team even drivers going to other teams. It's something that I take personal when someone doesn't want to be a part of our team anymore, even when I maybe shouldn't. An example, Joseph Newgarden. He won the championship, the IndyCar championship this season. He drove for our team in 2015 and 16. He won his first race driving one of our cars and really developed into an elite talent, one that we wanted to keep. He's obviously gone on to have success at Team Penske. Won, he's won two championships now. I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that part of me wasn't jealous that he's having that success somewhere else. <laughs> At the same time, I am proud of the role that, that our team played in that development. It's encouraging to me. And not to mention, going to his wedding tomorrow, so we're still good. <laughs> Beyond all my training and preparation for this sport, the two things that help me deal with this crazy life as much as anything are my family and my faith. Heather and our three kids, they motivate me way beyond my own desires of winning the Indy 500. The pride and joy that I see on their faces after a successful day on track, you know, it's beyond rewarding to me. I also believe in a higher power and that there's only so much that I can control. So I just try to maximize each day and attack each lap like it may be my last. Because one, one never knows what's gonna be my last day on track or our last day on this earth. Now, I'd like to do a little exercise. I'd like to ask you all to close your eyes, take a big deep breath, and then let it out. And you can open your eyes. In the time that it took for that little exercise, I lost the Indy 500. <laughs> that three seconds or so is the difference in me standing here today as an Indy 500 champion instead of a second place finisher. Now, with that being said, I am not done fighting for my dream of winning an Indy 500, and nor should you, any of you ever give up, on, give up on your goals or ambitions. Don't be afraid to go big, to take chances. And just as I have to drive with my eyes as far ahead as I can see on track, let's all just keep racing forward in life. Thank you. Mm -hmm.